Welcome back, everyone. Julian Clover from Broadband TV News will now host a fireside chat with four speakers from all three regions. The panel will discuss how satellite is thriving and ready to grow broadcasters and programmers' business in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Welcome everybody to our fireside chat and uh, gathered around our virtual fireplace we have uh, Awais Jaswal who is CEO of VIEW Media. Uh, Christel Meyer is a senior key account director for Intelsat. Sahir Abadkwa is managing sales director uh, for the MENA region for Intelsat and of course we met earlier Olivier Hasson, the managing sales director for media of, of uh, Intelsat. So I'm going to relax with my, uh, my, my, my cup of uh, cocoa here. I think I'm the only person who's actually brought such a, such a cup uh, along, along with them. Uh, let's start with Africa, if we can, which I think is very possibly one of the largest growing, fastest growing TV markets we have at the moment, particularly in the field of, of HD. But the yeah, the infrastructure down on the ground can be a little bit uh, unreliable uh, from from time to time, and uh, the sometimes tortured move, I think, from analog to uh, digital broadcasting on the terrestrial setup um, makes things even more complicated. Um, Christo, where where does sort of satellite uh, fit in here and, and and plug those gaps perhaps a little bit? Thank you. Okay. Well, what we've seen in Africa is that despite the challenges that we've had, satellite continues to grow in this market. And specifically in the space of free-to-air, um, we've also seen a number of free-to-air offerings being deployed using DTH or direct-to-the-home as a primary route to market, where direct-to-the-home were traditionally seen as a major enabler of pay TV operators. Um, so, in this particular market, I think a lot is happening. Um, there is major opportunities for newcomers. And of course, um, when we look at some of the challenges that we've got in this particular market, things like the lack of unreliable um, terrestrial connectivity, which has had a direct impact on the rollout of terrestrial broadcasting solutions like Direct to the Home, and unfortunately, the switch over from analog to digital broadcasting has been a very slow process in many countries. And the cost of maintaining these uh, and expanding these DTT networks has also been very restrictive. Because even so in South Africa, they're only just getting underway in the last, last few weeks with uh, finally making the move and the analog uh, switch off for, for terrestrial viewers. That just seems to be a, a complete nail space, particularly from somebody in a country where they, they, they switched off um, uh, analog broadcast terrestrially about 10 years ago. Yes. Well, in South Africa, they've only really started switching off a few of the provinces, but we haven't really made that full transition as yet. There's a lot of pressure to have that done by early New Year. So um, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to happen, and then specifically in the distribution of um, applicable sector boxes. Yeah, and you, may, you mentioned that um, you know, free-to-air channels were coming into the domain you know, previously occupied, uh, still occupied by, by pay TV, of, a, of which I guess uh, multi-choice or DSTV, I think some people uh, use, use the name for it, that, they previously occupied that space. So the people who are getting into free to air is that a, a a different market segment which has previously been the case for the premium they're not people switching down at all are they it certainly is a different market segment um but what we've also seen is we've got such a young population in africa today 77 percent of the africa population are below the age of 35 and all of these guys are looking at having access in some way or form to something that gives them um, either sports or education or entertainment, and they are prepared to access that on multiple platforms. But now the problem is that because we've got this lack of infrastructure, which really restricts, restricts, restricts access to the internet, a multi-platform is difficult. First, you need to have access to a 4G network, 
once you've got that access, cost of data is expensive. And except for that, you don't always have the right device available. So a lot of these young viewers are still looking at traditional platforms such as satellite, whether that's DTH or DTT, to consume content. Um, so definitely a changing landscape. And what we've seen is with new free-to-air operators coming into this space, delivering more compelling content, those neighborhoods are attracting the necessary eyeballs. And, and is there a role within all of that, say, satellites to kind of provide some internet connectivity that can be used by an age group, which in most other markets would be reaching for their phone at, uh, at every opportunity to watch a little snack of video or something? Um, sorry, Julian, can you repeat the question? Um, it didn't come through too clear. Sorry. Yes, I, I was wondering if there's a role for satellite in delivering um, some kind of internet service because that under 35 age group which you speak there is the one which is always on their mobile phones. So satellite is already delivering connectivity specifically in the rural areas with our um, VSAT type technologies. But what we're starting to see is um, technologies um, that is able to deliver OTT content over satellite to various spaces where that content then gets cached, whether that's a public space or whether that's at the edge of a mobile tower or whether that is at the edge of an ISP. Um, I think we very much still in the beginning of that particular technology is being deployed in um, sub-Saharan Africa, but it exists today. And I have so no still, doubt. still business to business by the sounds of things, with an operator still required to take it on that last mile to, to give the service to the consumer. Yes, it is still business to business. Um, it's not, you know, where the satellite uh, operator would engage with the, with the end consumer in a direct relationship. So, yes, our end customer would be a, typically a mobile network operator. It would be an ISP or it would be an operator that have invested into our OTT over satellite technology for public spaces. That's interesting. Because Olivier, that's a far cry from what we might see in, say, cent Central and East Europe, which one might argue is it's difficult to know how to measure if to say, and even if to say they are indeed further down the track than is the case in Africa, they're just on a on a on a different track, perhaps. And viewers in Europe are, are looking for something. No, quite quite different, really. They still want TV, but they want it presented to them in in a different way. I feel. Yes, Julian, so we have um, started to discuss this uh, earlier today uh, during the, the previous session. I think what's really important is uh, whatever it's coming from and uh, whatever is going to be the form is uh, make sure that the right contents will be uh, made available for the viewers and that they're aware of what's going on. And uh, you mentioned Europe, so it's definitely, uh, if we have to, uh, to stress one asset, we do have in a portfolio is on One West. IS102 is a partnership with, uh, with Telenor where we would like effectively, because it's an hybrid environment, that there are different technologies on uh, One West addressing up to 18 million uh, TV households uh, and families together. It's a mix of, you know, cable operators, obviously DTH operators. Uh, then you have the Nordics beam managed by Telenor and Anente Group. So it, it's, it's a very interesting ecosystem, a bit complex. Uh, but I think it doesn't really matter what is important for the viewer. The consumer is, is to have access to the right contents and, and make sure that those contents are available. And basically, we discussed that a bit earlier uh, this morning. We are uh, looking forward to, uh, to launch dedicated tool to make sure viewers are aware what's available and, and make a selection by genre, language, and obviously the, the platform. And this is the electronic program guide we are start to discuss earlier. Yes, and that's, that's a very interesting uh, in, innovation there. So here in the, in the, in the Middle East, that's, you know, how would you describe the, you know, the pay TV market, market there? It's, uh, one, 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 you know, there, there's lots of different groups and uh, countries and people wanting to be uh, seeing pay TV, but at the same time, uh, it, it's managed managing to bring maybe one dominant operator, it's difficult to, to, to pin it down in terms of, you know, the, uh, 
who people are getting their, their programs from, other than Intelsat, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Julian, absolutely. Uh, in the Middle East, I would say that the pay TV market is still underdeveloped and viewers rely heavily on uh, free to air currently. And to add to that, also content is limited to a few genres. So these are the challenges that we face here. Oh, as I guess your business can possibly potentially help that out by providing um, new channels into um, well any of any of the markets we've discussed. Uh, anything? Do, do, are you seeing? I, I guess these things go in waves, don't they? As to the kind of channels that operators are seeking, or the kind of channels that just decide that yeah, this is the market opportunity for for this. What what are the what are the trends um, for where you're sitting right now? Yeah, I mean, it's oh yeah, so. We do a lot of business in the Middle East and we do a lot of business in Africa as well. And, um, you know, two different markets, um, Africa, obviously, predominantly we see is FTA, um, but um, we, we are seeing some people looking at online, but predominantly we're still seeing satellite being key there. But the genres are quite mixed in, in the Middle East and there's a developed market in terms of ad income, you know, um, whilst when you go to Africa, we have the audience on FTA, um, but we don't have the development in terms of, you know, um, the ad market to support it on satellite. Um, but I think, you know, over the coming months and years, this will start to change with uh, a lot of the initiatives that are being done, you know, with the audience serve and so forth. But what, what do you need to happen in order to to build a, you know, if, you, if, if, if there's a new channel, it doesn't necessarily matter which, which genre it is, but what, what are the, the, the key factors that you need in order to sustain it? Because when anybody launches anything, there's always a bit of a punt to see as to whether or not it's actually going to work. But you need, you need something to make that seed germinate a little bit, don't you? I think it depends on the business model, right, um, of your channel. If you're an entertainment channel or, or a news, you know, well, entertainment specifically, you know, you, you probably want ad income to support that. Um, the business model. If you're a new channel, um, you may not be focused on the ad income. You may be more focused in terms of the potential audience that you're reaching. Um, so it really depends on the business model I find in, in Africa uh, that makes that decision. Um, that's the key thing, I think. And is there such a thing as, I don't know, a, a pan, a, a genuine pan-African advertising market or Middle East market within certain genres, or does the advertising ultimately have to be regionalized with different versions because otherwise a channel is just not going to be economically viable if it doesn't have these you know, regional advertising windows or different versions that do, that do different things? I, th I think Africa's um, pretty different in terms of the market. So, you know, Nigerian advertising market would be different to South Africa. And same as, you know, East Africa would be different to West Africa. So I think there is an element of regionalization requirement and the development in terms of those ad markets are, they're, they're in different stages. Uh, I think in South Africa, there, you know, there is like an official uh, body on standing in terms of audience measurement. Nigeria is not there, I don't think, at the moment. Um, and I think those are some of the challenges that broadcast within Nigeria still say they face, um, you know, where some things are, you know, some advertisers will not accept that. <laughs> but in South Africa, it's somewhat different. So I think, um, you know, you, you, can, you can be speaking to the same, you know, advertiser in Nigeria and South Africa, but the, you know, what their expectations are somewhat different. Um, Middle East, I think, is more generic, but I think, you know, um, there are some key markets in terms of population. I think the, one of the key things to maybe point out here is the opportunity. If you look at the population size in Africa and even the Middle East, I mean, it's a huge population. And I think Sahih has mentioned it before in the Middle uh, East. Christo was mentioning about uh, it being a very young market in, in Africa, um, particularly amongst the under, under 30, 35s. Is that... Um, is that something which satellite can then use to to its advantage in your view? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, a lot of people are talking about OTT and other offerings, but I, I think there, there is a space for everything in each market. Um, I think satellite is still dominant in, in, in Africa and even in the Middle East, um, you know, for watching TV that, you know, we are seeing obviously growth in OTT in the Middle East, but um, a lot of the broadcasters we speak to, you know, the first thing they'll look at 
and these are you know a lot of the independent channels um and sometimes in the tier tier ones um a lot of time they're looking at first is the distribution of satellite and i think ott is just an added value add for them in terms of reaching um you know more viewers maybe personalization but you're, you're saying it's still satellite first which is the interesting thing here it's it's like you know satellite is where they make their first booking and then maybe a little down the road that's only, only then do they start to look at ott Definitely. I mean, I think Chris Don mentioned about infrastructure. Um, what's really interesting is, you know, we offer OTT services to our existing Africa customers. And when we see the consumption of the, you know, how many viewers they have, it, it's, it's not very high, but the number of viewers they have on satellite is huge. And you look at the correlation and you think, you know, you, you see, obviously, there there is a reason why people are still watching them on satellite. There is an issue why people are not consuming them as much on the mobile phones, you know, infrastructure. It's very difficult in West Africa, for example, to have a call sometimes for 15, 20 minutes without interruption, let alone expect them to watch, you know. Can I, can I say that's also extremely difficult in South Cambridgeshire in the UK on regular occasions <laughs> to be able to maintain a call for longer than 20 minutes. Um, so here, in terms of, you know, the, the Middle Eastern market, what a... What are the countries in particular that we should be we should be watching at the at the moment for potential places where where the growth might be, particularly in the satellite, of course? I would say the GCC region, uh, Julian. This is like uh, this is this is which, which like, is where my geography is is not good at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait. We have a fast growing population and uh, where the economics makes sense. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. And do you, is this something which has been building over a period of time, or is this something you're looking, you you think is more more of a, a future thing? Yeah, it's more of a future thing, I would say, because it will take time to put all these business cases together and to build it. And uh, but but we can see this coming. We can see this coming in the near future. Okay, so I think I probably have to ask the same question of you. Of course, I think many people will be familiar with the South African market, but. Uh, there's plenty of others. I, I know particularly East Africa, for example, had a, had a particular spell where they, people should be launching satellite platforms once a fortnight. But what's, uh, well, what's happening now and where are the territories to, to watch for? I actually love that question because I do believe the whole of sub-Saharan Africa is potential. You know, considering today, only 43% overall of households actually have access to television set. Um, and what's interesting is that that actually correlates to the um, electrification rate in sub-Saharan Africa. Electricity or access to reliable electricity is a major problem. And I look at, you know, as access to electricity increases, as well as the number of households, there's a huge potential coming up in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, there's a lot happening in South Africa specifically, a lot happening in Nigeria, a lot happening in Ethiopia, but still more can be done in those three markets. And then I also see Kenya, Tanzania, Ghana, and the DRC as key growth markets within the next few years. And in terms of reaching them, you know, what, what satellite do they need to get on board? Where is the, uh, where, where's the action, if you like? And with that, which, uh, with which point of the sky should those dishes be pointed at? So IS-20 has been incredibly successful and purely because it's been in existence for more than 25 years. Uh, we wanted to validate audience numbers on IS-20 and we did an exercise with Geopol across five key markets, which actually the results were much better than we expected. Just in five markets, excluding South Africa, so that would be Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, we were able to validate that IS-20 already has more than 40 million households pointing their antennas towards our asset. Now, if we you know, can do that same exercise in South Africa and so Southern Africa, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to uncover some very interesting numbers there as well. We will be doing another Geopol survey later this year, and we need to continue doing that. I believe being able to deliver validated audience data does assist our customers using IS-20 to attract advertising revenue that is so desperately needed. Yeah. And so here, in, I think in, in terms of getting channels from Middle East, Africa and Europe across to the States, so that's, that's G19 is the, is, is the satellite that people have to look for. Absolutely. Yeah. So like we said earlier, 
like Crystal said, that today's satellite remains the most efficient way to reach a large number of viewers. And not only to a large number of viewers, but to reach the right viewers and with the right content. You know, there's an ongoing movement of population across the globe, and we can easily identify specific pockets of population in different regions. Example for you mentioned G19, and there's an over 1.2 million viewers in the U in the US via our G19 platform. And there's a growing, for example, Arab Arabic population in the US. And the approximately 200 channels currently being broadcasted to our G19 platform is surely relevant to them. And also important to mention that these viewers constantly are looking for more diversified and fresh content, which represents great opportunities for both programmers and broadcasters. Oh, well, so when these sort of channels use G19 and other satellites to get across to broadcast, I don't know, a service which is ostensibly targeted maybe at the Middle East, but actually there is as uh, Sahir was alluding to there, an audience in the States. Do, do they show the same version or do they tinker around with it, strip out the ads, put some new ones in or time shift it even to make sure that the, that the evening news actually turns up in the evening and not at breakfast time? Yeah, I, th I think um, time shifting is probably the key for those type of markets. Um, you know, will the ads be different? I think it depends, you know, um, if they have... Um, you know, advertisers in those new markets. But a lot of the time, it's um, what I find is people just wanted to reach that diaspora. Uh, and that's more important is, uh, you know, the ad, ad income isn't, uh, you know, it, it isn't a requirement for those, those type of markets. Um, so are they typically paying some sort of subscription fee in order to access those, those channels? No, I think a lot of them watching them um, FTA. I think uh, you know, right. definitely, uh, you know, with the, with the diaspora, it's more about reaching them. So you you know, you have it's you almost have, a vanity project up to up, up to a point. Well, yeah, you have government channels, you know, news channels. I want to reach the diaspora. Uh, yeah. Some people have dual nationalities, right? So you know, these are voters in some countries. Uh, you know, the, but you know, there is a there's a there is an audience there that wants to consume content you know, from their home country. And um, we, we see that, you know, in more cases, be it Africa, Middle East or North America. And, and Olivier, and I, we should probably wrap up in a moment or two, but um, it's interesting, the, the monetization opportunities for broadcasters who are looking to reach um, areas, as OAS was describing there, uh, in in North America, they what would you say they are over and above the traditional you know, sell some spot advertising? So that's a very good question, Julian. Bearing in mind that um, as we discussed earlier uh, this morning, uh, so if we talk about the U.S. market and the G19 that uh, uh, we have been discussing again with uh, with Sire, um, this. Same as IS-20 in Africa, this, uh, this satellite, this neighborhood was born as a purely free to wear. So basically, monetization is not even a, a concept, or, or it is a concept, it's virtual, right? Now it tends to change, and effectively, uh, uh, we are helping uh, our partners to make this change. And, uh, and, and, and this is why, as we discussed earlier, uh, the launch of a dedicated tool such as DPG makes perfect sense. So in order to target the right audience, the diaspora on G19, as we said, the Farsi Arabic speakers and probably one third of the Arabic and Farsi speakers living in the US are, are looking at G19. It's really important to do something with this audience. First of all, the education, make sure they're aware of what's going on, what is available today, now, next, and in the next seven or 14 days. But as well for the TV channel addressing this audience to take benefit from this dedicated, uh, from this dedicated specific audience and effectively to push potentially uh, ad advertising. You have different means to do that. And obviously using a, a dedicated electro electronic program guide is, is probably a, uh, a smart way to do it. Yeah, and certainly it sounds like uh, G19 has a good targeting going on uh, with, uh, with some of the... Uh, uh, some of the language groups it's able to reach. We are sadly out of time, uh, but thank you everyone for taking part in this little uh, fireside uh, chat of ours. Christelle, so uh, Sahar, uh, Awaz, and uh, also Olivier. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Julian, Awaz, Christelle, Olivier, and Sahar. We now have some time planned to answer the questions you have submitted through the Q&A feature.
We'll try to answer as many questions as we can.